Finally, I don't want to take up at your time this morning with a lengthy spiel, but I did want to say just a few things. Um, <clears throat> I'm not from the United States, <clears throat> but came here um, in mid-career from Belfast in Northern Ireland, where I grew up. Now, that was not a society without its deep problems and its multiple discriminations, um, and eventually broke down, as you know, into very serious violence. But when I came to the United States about 20 years ago, <clears throat> several things troubled me right from the very start, and they've not gone away. You see something you know, from a kind of immigrant's gaze um, when you come to a society that you don't know very well, but have decided to make your home. So four things troubled me right from the start, <clears throat> and they have not gone away. The first is the enormous wealth and pay inequality with people of color and women especially vulnerable to discrimination and oppression and unequal treatment. The second is the fact that there is no universal state-supported healthcare system open to everyone equally and free at the point of delivery, which is something even in the society that I came from that had many um, uh, difficulties and problems. That was one of the things that was a guarantee um, uh, a universal state-supported healthcare system open to everyone equally and free at the point of delivery. Third are the very obvious inequities in the criminal justice system, um, which result, as you, all of you know very well, better than I do, in the highest incarceration rates in the world um, in this country. And, and that's something that needs to be addressed. And fourth was the disturbing amount of gun violence and of mass shootings even from a society which was not free from uh, gun violence. All four of these issues bear hardest on uh, people of color and women, as you know uh, far better than I do. These were urgent matters then, and are even more urgent matters now. So thanks to all of you, especially for shining some light on these very dark corners of American life. So have a great day at HDS. I look forward to joining you later in the day. I've got to step out this morning to meet with the international provost and all kinds of issues that are affecting our community. But I will be back later. So welcome. We are really delighted to have you with us. And um, I look forward to a wonderful conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Hampton. Good morning again, and welcome to the fourth annual Black Religion, Spirituality, and Culture Conference. My name is Nicole Morris, and I'm a second year student here. I'm a Master of Theological Studies student, in addition to being a co-chair for this year's conference. Um, we are so honored to welcome you all to this very special and sacred space that we hope to continue to cultivate with you all today, um, throughout the day. When we were considering the theme of this year's conference, Black Women at the Center, we really were thinking about ourselves, our mothers, our grandmothers, our mentors, and all of the black women who are so often who we are so often inspired by but rarely gain access and are rarely acknowledged in spaces like these. This conference was founded by black women and has primarily been sustained by the work of black women in the last four years of its existence here at the Divinity School. We dedicate this day to all black women with an intentional X to include all black women, including our trans sisters and femmes in this room and those who are not physically present with us here today and those who have passed on. Thank you for your love and your work in leading the way toward justice. We recognize that we could not possibly encompass all of the brilliance and all of the experiences of black women across the diaspora, but we are really excited to just share a snippet of some of those experiences and work with you all today. While we are so grateful for the fact that you all are here, and that we're blessed and honored to highlight the voices and work of incredible scholars, activists, change makers, and students throughout the day. It's also necessary to acknowledge that spaces like this do not often exist for us as black women, and that even cultivating this space for us today posed its own challenges with planning support, funding, and recognition for the work and time that it has taken to put everything together. Nonetheless, we, myself, Kayla J. Smith, and Ashley Lipscomb, as this year's primary planners, persisted, and I think that it is telling that this year's conference, highlighting the work of black women, was not only organized by a group of black women, but also has been primarily supported by black women volunteers. Shout out to our amazing hosts of last night's open mic. 
Thank you. For me, this conference itself feels like divine work, and I often tell folks that black women, period, is my personal religious orientation. Again, thank you all for being here and for your support and presence for this year's conference. As I mentioned, this is the fourth year of the conference, and we're excited for the energy from today to foster years of this work to come. Um, so before we get started today, I just want to give a little bit of just logistical information. So in terms of bathrooms, um, we have bathrooms on this floor to the right, as well as downstairs, and there are elevators to get downstairs. We also have an all-inclusive restroom downstairs. Um, there's also exits on to your right, and, and you can go right or left once you exit those main doors. Okay. Um, so yeah, before we get started on everything else that's to come, I'd also like to acknowledge Jamie Johnson Riley. You can raise your hand, Jamie. So Jamie, so Jamie is this year's Sankofa Award honoree, and we'll explain more about that at the dinner tonight, um, but she won't be able to join us in person at the dinner, so if you have time, please tell her congratulations, and thank you for all the work that you put in and all the love you give us, Jamie. Yeah. Um, so let's begin with, um, with our Racial Justice Fellow and Healing Practitioner, Melissa Wood Bartholomew, who's going to offer us an opening reflection to ground us today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It is a privilege and an honor to be here with each of you. I uh, first just want to start by thanking our creator and continuing in the acknowledgement of our ancestors who have been so beautifully acknowledged. I am rooted in the African tradition, which compels me to always be mindful of our connection through the spirit to our ancestors, those who have laid the ground that we walk on those whose wisdom that we are building upon, and, and their connection to our contemporary moment. So I give thanks to those who have gone before us and those who wished they could be here but could not, those who we acknowledge in the spirit. And I also want to add my congratulations and my gratitude to the beautiful women who have planned this gathering. When Nicole sent me the outline, I told them the other day that I felt the anointing on this work. This work is anointed. The fact that they have decided to focus and center the voices of women who were formerly incarcerated is extraordinary. So I'm humble to be a part, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide you with these opening reflections. And I acknowledge the dean and all the administrators and staff, those of you who are here, and all of those who contributed to this moment. This conference is highlighting the multiple dimensions of the experience of black women in the academy. We stand at the intersections of our community's pain, trauma, but also our community's power and resilience. This gathering is critical. It's centering the work of healing with women survivors of the incarceration experience and exploring our black imagination as we vision our way forward in and beyond the academy. This is a powerful response to the urgency within our community and our world to address mass incarceration through the lens of black women who are often left out of the discussion and the analysis. Mass incarceration is a moral and spiritual crisis calling us to bring our religious and theological analysis to bear, as well as our spiritual imagination, force, and power. I want to bring in the voice of the late Dr. Katie Cannon, womanist theologian, who spent time here. And I want to read an excerpt from one of her essays and it's in a book entitled um, Katie, Katie's Canon, Womanism and the Soul of the Black Community. She wrote many of her essays in this book while she was a research associate here. And here's what she says about womanist consciousness at the end of her essay entitled The Emergence of Black Feminist Consciousness. She says, black feminist consciousness may be more accurately defined or identified as black womanist consciousness. To use Alice Walker's concept and definition, as an interpretive principle, the black womanist tradition provides the incentive to chip away at oppressive structures bit by bit. It identifies those texts that help black womanists to celebrate and rename the innumerable incidents of unpredictability, unpredictability in empowering ways." End quote. 
This gathering today is aligned with black womanist feminist tradition and is serving as an interpretive experiential framework to help us celebrate and reimagine our activism and our scholarship and all of our praxis driven work and to prioritize healing as the way forward. So we are being called today by these women to a different way. As you go throughout the day, I invite you to listen with intention. I invite you to be purposeful about your connections. I invite you to stay open and to hear and to feel. And in other words, I invite you to not be a spectator, but to be fully present and engaged and ask how you can find your way in to the work that we're exploring here today. I want to invite you to begin that engagement by just taking a moment now to say hello and to acknowledge the person to your right and to your left. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And keep that spirit throughout the day. Oftentimes when we gather for, for conferences, we come and we go. We don't connect. We don't see each other. But this is, this is meaningful, powerful work. And these women have called us to center the work of healing. And that the very basic, the foundational level of healing work is connection and cultivating connection to each other. So stay connected and be connected with intention. Before I close, I want to lead us in a grounding meditation. And I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. And at some point, I'm going to be reading the words of another black woman, the late poet Lucille Clifton, and her poem entitled, Won't You Celebrate Me?, which honors the resilience of black women. Take a moment now, if you have anything in your hand, I encourage you and invite you to let go of whatever is in your hand. I invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you, but all of this is an invitation. Just get comfortable in your seat. Feel grounded in the chair that holds you and breathe. We have been blessed with a new morning that was not promised when we laid down last night. This is the end of the week and we've all been through many challenges and experiences, but we are here together now, and we want to fully commit ourselves and our intentions, our hearts, our minds to this experience. So as you breathe, give thanks for the breath that sustains you. As you breathe, Feel your heart expanding wider with each breath. As you breathe with your hearts opened, your minds open, your ears attuned, listen to the words of Lucille Clifton. Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into? a kind of life. I had no model. Born in Babylon, both non-white and woman, what did I see to be except myself? I made it up. Here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. We are here to celebrate the spirit that has protected us against that thing and those things that every day has tried to kill us and has failed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. All right, now I'd like to welcome Ashley Lipscomb up to introduce our first panel. Thank you. 
we thank you all for coming. And as we do this, I'm going to ask our uh, panelists and our moderator to also come up. And I'll do the introductions as you sit. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Okay. If you don't know, I'm a black Baptist preacher. I like noise. So call a response, class it, and feel comfortable and alive. Um, and so in this moment, I am honored to introduce this panel to, to you all today. Um, but before I begin the introduction, I must read a quote by the one, the great Angela Davis as we lift her in this space. Prisons do not disappear social problems, they disappear human beings. Homelessness, unemployment, drug addiction, mental illness, and illiteracy are only a few of the problems that disappear from public view when the human beings contending with them are, re are relegated to cages. Thank you, Queen. And so in this moment, I am going to introduce our first opening discussion by our keynote speakers here today, Centering Healing, A Way Forward, a discussion with women survivors of incarceration. Uh, this discussion centers healing as a mechanism towards justice and equity on behalf of women who have experienced harm due to an unjust and racist criminal injustice system. As I reflect on this moment, my good friend Shonda Plowden, who will be on uh, the alumni panel later today, she's also my roommate, great woman. <laughs> she gets to live with me. Uh, she, <laughs> you know. She said to me last night, as we thought um, the other night, as we thought about this panel, she said, Ashley, do you realize this panel comes full circle for you? Mm. And I said to her, well, what do you mean? And she said, the first time you attended the Black Religion, Spirituality, and Culture Conference, you sat on a panel in the front row, right there in front of all those people, and you spoke about faith and incarceration. You talked about your time at the Essex County Community, uh, Essex County Correctional Facility <laughs> Jail, uh, where you were chaplaining as an intern. You talked about the relationship you shared with your mother, and you talked about your mother. And in that moment, you read her words, her letter to you from prison in front of a room full of people. And today, she gets to speak her own words to this very same audience. As a child of incarcerated parent, parents, I understand the hardships. People believe that, in the words of Angela Davis, prisons disappear people. However, they do not disappear the families that endure these hardships. The pain, the missed birthdays, graduations, and events. You know, I joke and tell my friends, it was easier for me to live when I wasn't woke. Mm. <laughs> because the minute I woke up and I realized that this world taught me to hate what they put my mother through, I learned then that there were systems put in place that my family might be broken. But in this moment, in this panel, I uplift the fact that we have strong women who sit before us today who've endured a system that some of us would not be able to make it through. And they sit here to share their stories, to empower not just themselves, but the rest of us in this room. So the healing that you will hear, that you will think about today, not only happens for them, but it happens for myself. It happens for Ebony, who sits here next to me. It happens for other children who grew up like we did, for other sisters and brothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents who think about their loved ones who have had to endure this system because of powers beyond our control. And so now I'm going to get off my soapbox and read these here bios of these wonderful great women. And they read like this. On our panel, we have the great Stacy Borden. Stacey has a master's degree in mental health counseling with a concentration in addictions and trauma. 
Stacey Borden is a founder and president of New Beginnings Reentry Services Incorporated. She is an author, performance artist, motivational speaker, and activist. She has been on several panel discussions about the criminal justice system and how the prison system and mass incarceration has impacted women and families of color. Stacey has also been a guest lecturer at Berkeley College of Music, and her story inspires students to do their final project on mass incarceration. Stacey is a proponent of drama therapy with an empathic value in the individual suffering from trauma and addictions. She is currently a board member with On With Living and Learning, OWLL, Productions, a nonprofit organization. On With Living and Learning works with formerly incarcerated women in dynamic workshops that incorporate reading, writing, storytelling, and active listening to build imperative life and job skills. Through storytelling, they work through challenging past, creating art that is healing for the individual while building self-esteem and developing skills that will enable successful reentry to society. Also, board member with Families for Justice as Healing, an organization by and for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls and women with loved ones who are locked up. We are working to end the incarceration of women. Stacy Borden, formerly incarcerated, is a member of the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls, and is a member of the NAADAC, the Association for Addiction Professionals. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you have a crowd and you have support. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I want to scream as loud for this next person. <laughs> Sylvia Lipscomb is a native of the city of Passaic, New Jersey. She is the mother of five beautiful daughters. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> She has spent more than 25 years in the penal system throughout her life. She is currently rebuilding her life and doing something different and anew. As a first-time student, she is attending the Passaic County Community College, where she hopes to begin her journey towards social justice and advocacy. She is the inspiration behind my own personal work as I develop and learn more about the pains of the prison industrial complex and its impacts on families. My thesis is entitled, let me get on my soapbox again, uh, <laughs> Dear Ma, I'm Sorry. A Woman's Critique of the Criminal Injustice System. So for her, I honor you, mother, and say thank you. And finally, this discussion is moderated by our own Ebony Nash. Ebony is a first-year MTS student at Harvard Divinity School with her focus area as African and African-American studies. She is especially interested in black liberation theology and the role it plays in mass criminalization criminalization. Nash received her bachelor's degree at Hastings College, where she triple majored in criminology, psychology, and religion. Woo! Woo! <laughs> there, she was able to complete several research projects in and around the topics of incarceration. With having experience as a child of an, of an incarcerated parent, Nash has a special interest in the indirect relationship incarceration has on the community. She is looking forward to the topic and discussion at this year's Black Religion, Spirituality, and Culture Conference. Yeah, let's give it a <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? You want me to speak a little louder? Yeah. I'm pretty loud anyways. So um, I just want to thank everybody, first of all. Welcome. Good morning. 
Um, thank you to the wonderful ladies again, just echoing for giving us this space and allowing us the, the room to foster this very important conversation. I want to thank everyone for coming and investing your time into um, this panel. Um, and it is an investment, and I want to reiterate that a lot because this panel is very rare, and I don't see this panel happening often. So thank you again for investing in yourself, investing in us, and uplifting the wonderful women survivors of mass incarceration. Um, I definitely want to lay out the sacredness of this room and remind everybody that these topics are very, um, very impactful and very um, life-changing. And just the sacredness of holding them wholesome and close to your heart is very important to us. And not only take them in, but also take them as an action on your way out. Mm -hmm. So I think we should start. Um, our first speaker, we're going to leave, leave room for Stacy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, yes. I would yeah. like, you have a video? I do. Okay. Can we, um, first let me just say thank you. This is an honor to be here. I always try to begin my conversation. I'd be remiss if I did not honor my mentor, Andrea James, who is the founder of the National Council for Incarcerated and Incarcerated, formerly incarcerated women and girls. She's amazing. She has really given me a, a different platform, a different outlook on life, and um, along with my family, giving me that type of support to even navigate coming out of the prison system. Mm -hmm. So um, I have much to say. I didn't write any speeches. I write speeches, and then I don't read them. So I just speak <laughs> from my heart. So I, I also just want to say that there's no questions that I would not answer. If I miss something, please ask the question. My life is an open book, and this would help me as well as you understand where we come from, women in the prison system. So I, I'd like to show that video because I, I want to say that Massachusetts is the first state that we've been able to pass the primary caretaker's law, which means that we take out of the power from the prosecutor's hands back into the judge's discretion should they sentence this woman with children or not. Mm -hmm. This is the first state that we've been able to do that in with Senator Brownsberger, and we're now in our seventh state. Um, Tennessee is the seventh state that approved the Primary Caretakers Act. So, you know, when you start listening to our stories, the suggestion is we find different alternatives to sentences. We should not continue to separate families because it's, it continues to perpetuate the idea of generational trauma, generational incarceration, school to pipeline, prison. There's so much to talk about with this whole idea of the prison industry complex. But first, let me just tell you a little bit about my story. And it's not so much about my story. It's about all the women that I left behind when I left the prison in 2010. I, too, had spent a greater part of 30 years of my life in and out of the prison system because of my trauma. I had no clue that I had trauma. I didn't know that I was dealing with mental health. I come from a family of 12 siblings and an alcoholic father who made a decision when he was 50 to stop drinking. By then, he was my dad. I had older brothers and sisters, I'm the 11th child, and there was so much dysfunction going on in the household, I had no clue, I stayed outside the house. But I stayed outside the house mostly because I was being sexually molested by an older brother who too had some mental illness. That was tough. Nobody would hear my story. There was a few of us that knew. I had such um, rebellion and, and um, resentment and anger against my parents because I thought that they should have known. I thought they were supposed to be my saviors. But I couldn't tell. I didn't know how to tell. And even with that, I was given drugs at such an early age. I was sniffing cocaine at 11 years old, and I was bagging marijuana up in the household to sell it at school. So I don't really have a recollection of being in school. I just know that I graduated from JP High. That's all I know. I don't, it was like my life just wasn't present. Even when I kind of got myself together a couple of times, I would go home and ask my mom to show me my diploma. Did I even graduate? Was I even present? Like, what happened? I just have no recollection of it. Trauma has a way of just keeping the brain in a survival mode and you just exist. 
That was what happened to me in my life. And through drug addiction, I veered out to venture something in the street that led me from my, my sexual abuse to my drug abuse to then being sexually assaulted at 18. That kept me in the street. I just did not know how to feel or deal or anything. And that led me into the criminal justice system, my criminal behavior. Getting arrested, I don't know how many times I've, I've been arrested. I don't even know how many times I've been sentenced. I just felt like that was safer for me and that was okay because I wasn't gonna be hurt anymore. And it wasn't until my last sentence in 2007 when I had 15 warrants all over Massachusetts that I said, I don't know, I call it maturation. Something happened. I just knew that I needed to deal with what was going on in my life. I had been feeling like I was disrespecting my sisters who were serving natural life sentences who were just like me. Now, I really don't like the word nonviolent to violent. If you are living in that type of penal system and you're living with these women constantly and you get to know them, they're women. They're human beings. Mm -hmm. To the world, they committed heinous crimes. But to us, we were just trying to survive. They were no different than me. Now, were there some in there that had sociopathic tendencies? I'm sure. I'm all about dismantling the criminal justice system. I'm all about ab abolishing the whole jail process. When you're living in something like that, you just become numb to the whole thing mm -hmm. until you sit in a circle with some of these women and you hear their stories. Mm -hmm. 2007, I made a decision that I was gonna change my life around. Somehow, I was not gonna continue to do this and allow the perpetuation of going in and out of that revolving door continue to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And so I made a decision to go to court and once I made that decision, it was almost universal or spiritual. I always give it to the universe. It has nothing to do with me. I just made a decision, and the universe took it from there. Once I made that decision, I was able to go into Quincy Court, Quincy District Court. And for once in my life, at 47 years old, a judge looked at me and said, what is wrong with you? Your record is notorious. To me, I'm saying, well, I didn't hurt nobody. I was stealing money. I was trying to survive. After he said that to me and I told him, it just all came out. You see, my father also worked in the court system. My father was a superior court officer. So judges knew who we were. And that judge knew I was George Borden's daughter. And that was the universe. It was almost like my savior. It was time to tell the truth. And I just blurted it all out. I just said, Your Honor, you know, I, I come from sexual abuse. I don't know how to survive. That was my survival. I need to go back into the prison system and go to the CRA program. I couldn't even believe I said that. Who wants to go back to jail? You see, I didn't have the courage. My pain was too deep. I didn't have the courage to check myself into a substance abuse program. I had already been sectioned and sentenced into these treatment facilities, and it just didn't work for me. Every time I completed it, I didn't remember anything that I learned or any tools that I gained, and I just kept running. So I asked the judge to allow me to go into the CRA program. And he asked me, what is the CRA program? I said, it's called Correction Recovery Academy. I needed to be corrected. I needed some recovery, and I definitely needed to be educated. And he said, well, what would that take? I said, I don't know, I think three to five. I might have been a little manipulative because I was probably looking at 10, and I wasn't willing to do that. So I just like, <laughs> it's time to sentence myself. <laughs> For the first time in my life, he wrote some notes, and he said, you're gonna go over to Norfolk Superior. You know that, right? I said. If that's what it takes, I'd rather indict myself than let you do it. Mm -hmm. You've been doing it forever. And I was grateful. And I, by the time I left that, I don't know what you want to call it, transportation truck? Mm -hmm. Like it's barbaric. I think it's the first time I ever really realized that the connection to slavery and being transported and being sold was right there in my pocket. Mm -hmm. 
And I said, my God, in the past nine months, I've been transported 64 times. That's a destructive behavior I did to myself. But that was the reality of what's happening with the slave trade. You're taking me from shackling me with 10 other women from court to court, sold over this one. DA says, yeah, we got you. We'll make a deal over here. I just felt like I was on a chopping block. I was like, this got to end. So by the time I got over to Norfolk Superior, that judge said, wow, this is different. What are we looking at here? And I said, we're looking at an end to this. We're looking at an end to this. And he asked me what I wanted, and I said, I'll take a three to five today. I'm going into a behavioral program. It wasn't so much a drug program. I needed to really see what was going on with my behavior. And after I finished with that sentence out of Norfolk Superior, it was almost like I went from a county transportation truck to heaven. <laughs> I wasn't even shackled when I went in the state trans. Now, this isn't to sell you, like, go do no crime so you could get that type of feeling, that heavenly feeling. <laughs> it's just part of my experience that I needed in that moment. And I got in that transportation, that state transportation truck, and I was free. I wasn't shackled. I was able to communicate. The, the drivers, the COs treated me different. And I was like, wow, did they change? No, in that moment, I said, wow, Stace, change is really real. This is what they've been talking about for a long time, that we have the ability to change. Change our mind. Just as quick as you can talk yourself into something, mm -hmm. you can talk yourself out of something. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, that's what I really feel like I did. And by the time I got to back to Framingham, which I had spent many, many, many years in, it was almost like it was a college dorm. Mm -hmm. I was ready. And I got it back in that prison, and I just got busy with myself. I went back and forth to court got rid of all the county sentences, did my time, and I went into BU and I started realizing that I could learn something. Mm -hmm. I started creative writing, I went back on the unit and I started dealing with myself and other women and I learned that I had a voice. Mm -hmm. And more so, I would also be remiss if I didn't speak about my best friend Kimia, whom I left behind, who had the same trauma as myself. And when I tell the story about Kimia, Kimia Faust, Kimia Faust was from the same area, Humboldt Ave, that I grew up on. She was younger than me. But when she came into the prison sentence, into the prison with her sentence, she had a 20-year sentence for manslaughter. And she was so highly medicated that I knew, I said, man, this is explosive. We're talking about pharmaceutical monies are going on. We're talking about the real suppression of our black sisters who are coming in. Just, just medicate them up. So they don't feel nothing. So they won't even know what sentence that they had. And I'm looking at this young woman, and I'm like, my God, my spiritual self needed to connect with her. And when I read her transcripts, I knew then that this was unrighteous. This was just unjust. And when I say that is to say that Kimia was raped at 12 years old. Suffolk County DA's office prosecuted that gentleman who sexually molested or raped this young girl at 12. Something happens in the brain, mentally. You're just checked out. Trauma. She existed until she was 18. Sexual assault at 18. It wasn't until she went back to her parents' house that she saw a picture on the refrigerator that the gentleman was a friend who had sexually assaulted her at 12, and it just took her somewhere else, and she started getting high and smoking crack and using heroin, and she just checked out until she entered another man's apartment in safety, she thought, mm -hmm. to get high again, and he sedated her. And three days later, she woke up naked with semen all over her body. And she took a butter knife to get him off of her. And he died. The same Suffolk House or Suffolk DA's office prosecuted her that she was a victim in at 12. Mm -hmm.
Kimmy is on his 16th year. I left out of that prison system in 2010. I made a promise to them, the girls, my sisters, that I was gonna get out and do something different, and I was gonna create a reentry program so we would never have to go through that <laughs> process again. And it would be different than the fundamental programs that are already existing. I'm here to say that we have our first residential reentry home. New Beginners Reentry Services, and we're calling it Kimia's House. Aww. It's dedicated to Kimia, who should be honored, who should be loved and cared for, and to not have to ever be violated in that sense again. And part of New Beginners Reentry Services, we're going to do some creative healing, creative art. We're going to do some theater. We're going to get to the core of the trauma. And we're going to learn how to grow up that little girl that needs to be nurtured and loved and know what needs and strengths are that we didn't develop as a little girl. I'm gonna play. I'm gonna have fun. And we're gonna do some storytelling and, and change the language of how we view ourselves. You know, the prison system has a way of calling us inmates mm. and felons. Mm. David Ellis, who is deceased now, may he rest, is formerly incarcerated and went to NYC. And when he came out, he wrote what's called the language letter. We don't call ourselves inmates, felons. I'm not even calling myself a survivor. I have survived the ultimate. Sexual abuse, drug addiction, incarceration, the whole gamut. We've survived. And so I'm going to leave you with to understand and remember, language is demeaning. When I say that I belong to a national council for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated women and girls, it's a movement like never before. We're going across state lines. <laughs> We're doing clemency movements. We're trying to do participatory defense organizing. We're at 100 R. Warren Street Tuesday nights. We sit with our families in the communities and we look at, none of us are lawyers, <clears throat> but we probably should be. Mm. We've been in the criminal system long enough. But we're really getting busy with ourselves and we're really giving the support to our people. Our whole hashtag, our whole theme is hashtag free her. When families come in front of us that are hurting, that are either facing the criminal justice system themselves or their family members, I have one young woman who's 44 years old. Her dad has been in prison going on his 45th year, wrongfully convicted. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention Raymond Gaines. That we've developed, Rachel Rollins' office out of Suffolk County DA's office has developed a conviction integrity unit, and he's one of the first cases on her, on her desk mm. to really review and look at with this police brutality of our community. Raymond Gaines's case has been part of the Charles Stewart case with the same police officer that came in and infiltrated our community and mm -hmm. brutally assaulted our black men and women mm -hmm. when they blamed Willie Bennett for the death of this man's wife. The same officer who penned five cases that I've researched so far on death that these gentlemen have not committed. And so we're really, really actively looking at the whole system as a whole, and I'm so grateful that these progressive DAs across the country, Philadelphia, Virginia, Chicago, Detroit, New York, Massachusetts, I think five of them are black women who are saying that they're going to stop this type of perpetual incarcerated people for drug addiction and trauma. Unfortunately, I wasn't one of them. Fortunately, I'm really grateful that I have came out of that mindset. And I'm <laughs> kind of almost grateful for every part of my life that I went through, because I wouldn't be here today to advocate for those sisters that I left behind. 
I just want to say, um, Lissetti, I love you. Lissetti back there is a freshman student who contacted me and said that she needed to do a project and, and couldn't figure out anybody to find. And I'm not sure if you said Cornell West referred you to me or if Cornell was your... And I'm like, I don't know how that even happened, but that's, <laughs> that's an honor. I love you. Thank you. She wrote a powerful story and gave me a piece of me that I had no clue and said that I was a womanist. And I'm honoring that, and I feel that, and I'm grateful. So thank you. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you. Um, thank you also for lifting up my sister, Liz Sadie. Um, yeah, man. Yeah, she's great. She's awesome. So your story is so powerful. I think we can all agree in how humbled we are to hear it. Um, quickly, I just have one question. Okay. Um, I feel, I really feel when you're explaining your um, the transition in the court and how you finally reclaimed your agency within yeah. your life. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's very impactful, and it's a very um, untold part of women who experience incarceration story is the, the moment that they reclaim the agency. Mm -hmm. um, and how you reclaimed the agency and you went on to another facility um, working and working towards your education, uplifting other women, mm -hmm. what grounded you? How did you find grounding within that? Well, I want to say my family, mm -hmm. my sister-in-law, mm -hmm. my aunt, Lynette Tyler, my family. Mm -hmm. I came home 2010, and both parents were, were terminally ill, mm -hmm. and I couldn't process. I couldn't. I had to make a decision right then and there that I couldn't have regrets for what happened in my life. I needed to be supportive, and that came from my sister-in-law, mm -hmm. who was really my big sister, been in my life since I was born. Right. She stayed right there, and she gave me that leverage to say, "Sis, you can do this. You can, you can do this. You can face it." And I and I made a promise then. And I looked at my dad, who was always so loving. Like, one end would be, my mom would be like, "Bail her out," and he'd go run and get me. And then on the other end, she'd be like, "No, leave her in there. You, she's gonna do this again." And he's like, no, I'm going to get my daughter. And in that moment when I saw all this happening and my sister standing there really supporting their transition, I knew then that I needed to be grounded. I knew then that my mother used to call me itchy feet. <laughs> I didn't know why she called me that until I was facing that year that I ran. I kept running away from the house because that's where the trauma was. And in that moment, I needed to be grounded. I learned some grounding techniques. I was always floating out here, watching myself drown and die. And in that moment, I looked at my family, and I said, wow, I got to give my mom and dad all they got. I don't know what terminal really means. Mm -hmm. And I supported them. One year, I stayed in that house with my sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. And my dad passed away December 18th, 2010. And I made him a promise that I would, he can go peacefully, Dad. It's time to go, because he was in pain. And God just found a way to make him okay. His skin was soft. It was almost like he was just asleep. And then the four months after that, I said, my God, after 65 years of their marriage, who's going to sleep with her? Mm -hmm. I'm like, her? Am I calling her? That's my mom. And I had to learn forgiveness. And I had to let go of resentment. And when I did that, again, spiritually, my mom told me her story. Who knew she had an alcoholic father? And she was always getting the brunt of her being the second to the youngest and her dad beating them, her sisters and her brother. And then the loss of her third child that she thought one drink smothered the baby but it was really Bobby died of SIDS. Mm -hmm. And when I heard her story, I was like, no wonder you couldn't hug me, and no wonder all the years I'm screaming to say, just in prison, why don't you say you love me? <clears throat> and in that moment, in that, Diane, remember every night, I would listen to her story and we'd talk more, and we got closer and closer and closer, until four days before my mom died, she said, 
Stacy, I love you. And I'm like, what? You finally said it? And I jumped on her. And that was my closure. And then we started talking about the baby Bobby and her father, and if she's going to see dad. And I don't know what's up there. I don't know if there's an up there. But if she believed it, then that's where I took her. That's where I took her for her closure. And that's what grounded me. And then she passed, and that was it. It was time to get busy. I had to keep my promise. I said, I'm going to college. I won't say the college that denied me because of my transcripts. <laughs> but spiritually, something took me to Cambridge College. And I bought my Corey and the obituary for my dad. You see, the Boston Globe won't write an obituary unless it's something merited. And because my father had been become a civil rights activist in the community, belonged to Roxbury Community Comprehensive, um, multi-service center. He was president of Kiwanis. He did so much in the community. He opened up a detox. I'm like, man, I gotta be like this dude. This dude was kind of powerful. When I read the, the Globe that investigated when he died, I was like, I'm bringing this too to Cambridge College. And I presented my case in that admissions office, and she started crying, Denise Haley, and said, you know what, I'm going to admit you, but don't fail. Don't fail me. And I was like, fail you? Shit, I can't fail me. I just can't. <laughs> I'm going to go back to prison. I'm not going back there. And when I opened up the door, when I was leaving, there was a plaque on the wall that said Antioch University, and I was, I was just stopped for that moment in time. And I was like, Antioch University? And she said, yeah, it used to be Cambridge College. It used to be any. I said, my dad got his master's from any. <laughs> dad is still helping me. And that's where I got my groundedness. And I just needed to stay grounded. I am not floating around anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm going to remain a student. I want to continue to learn. I don't talk academic levels. That's not who I am. I speak from my heart. My heart is in it. And I'm all about... Free her. I'm going to fight until we bring our sisters home. And that's where I'm at. Thank you. I want to affirm you in that, in saying that what grounded you, we can safely assume, is what also grounded the people around you during yeah. your time. Um, I definitely believe that some people don't actually have a, a grounding place, and so I want to lift up those who are indirectly affected yes. by um, mass and criminalization and how their support for those who they love and how that uplifts them as well as the people that they are in contact. So that's great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I want to make time and also love to hear a little bit about Sylvia's story. Do you mind sharing a little? Oh, no, no, no. This morning when I came, it was a few people, so I was like, I got this. <laughs> and I was like, everybody's in here. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> First of all, Ashley went out. Um, um, I used to always write to Ashley. Ashley was one of my children who I was always saying was God's sin. I have five. And dealing with five um, women on uh, five different levels is like, uh. But Ashley was always the one. I have to tell you about Ashley. Um, at five years old, by the grace of my mom, we come from a religious family. We were grounded, rooted in the church. And um, even if I wasn't there, my parents, my mom made sure that my girls went to church every Sunday as well as when I was a child. So it was something different about Ashley. One day I'm out and I'm teaching her to ride a bike. Uh, another milestone that I felt very, very, very happy to be there for that event, you know, because I was in an addiction. So the little small things that I would do was just so uplifting. I, I would talk about that for days. I taught her how to ride a bike. But anyway, that day when I'm, I, I have Ashley and I'm in back of her and she's pedaling, trying to pedal and I'm holding on. And the day she says, God's gonna help me ride my bike. And I let her go and Ashley continued to ride that bike. And I, I'm like, a child at five years old who has that much belief in God, that's, that's, that's really, really special and really, really huge. 
And it started a relationship between she and I that whenever I'm going through something, she's the child I go to and just be venting. I, I, I just vent. And she say, Mom, 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 you got to tone it down a little today. You know, you can be around some kind of people. But if I slip up, it's so, you know, it's just me. <laughs> but um, my story is a little, a little different. And please have patience because... Um, it's the first time I'm really talking and telling my my story. Mm-hmm. Um, as I said, I come from a very, very religious family. Um, my grandparents and their brothers and sisters actually built the church from the ground up in North Carolina. So God has always been a part of my life. Growing up, um, mother and father, no dysfunction. I had a sick brother who had sickle cell anemia. So we spent a lot of time at hospitals. My sister and I, you know, kind of running the house. My mom worked and she took care of a sick child. My dad worked. Everything was good. I I had a really happy childhood, got everything. We weren't rich, but I never lacked or wanted for anything. Mm -hmm. So I blame my addiction on myself. I never blamed anyone or anything, not to take away from anybody's story. It's just that it was my foolishness and the love of a man. Mm -hmm. Right, Ashley? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, um, it was was just something that um, I got into and um, it's, it's true when they say it starts with a party drug and then it, it mm-hmm. elevates and it escalates a little. Mm-hmm. And watching the film when it says in the 80s is when um, the black families really crashed and because crack mm-hmm. was truly introduced and you really had to be there in that time mm-hmm. to see how this epidemic mm-hmm. exploded. It yeah really broke the dynamics of the families, especially when you had families with single moms who became victims to that addiction of crack because that's a really powerful, powerful drug. Mm -hmm. So I went through that process and without even understanding, like you, I've always tried different kinds of drugs, you know, Mm -hmm. I would like, yeah, I'll try this one time. And, but it was the crack that really took me out of my element. And when the love of your family can't keep you grounded in your house, that's something powerful because I was always used to family love. I come from a family of 50 50 first cousins. And that was in 1972. And in 1972, I had 128 second cousins. And we've grown much more since then. But within my family dynamics, and I'm talking sister, cousins, aunts, and uncles, we're a really, really, really tight-knit family. So when I started this thing with this drug addiction, it escalated into heroin. Now, heroin is something that um, is physical becomes a physical craving. It's fun in the beginning until you wake up one day and you can't get out the bed because your stomach is hurting and you got sweat everywhere and you just don't care. You just don't care. I was producing children and where I should be with my kids because of the deterioration of my body of my looks, my well-being, I was ashamed and I didn't want anybody to see me. And I didn't want to go to my family and ask them, you know, for money because they were going to tell me no anyway, you know, because my family, my parents, they really did not understand addiction. They really didn't. They were, they were from the South and that, that just didn't happen in the South back then. When they migrated, To the north, you know, they were becoming aware of certain things, but to have it hit home, so close to home, it was devastating to them. I I get a little emotional because as I'm talking, I'm also living my truth. Mm -hmm. And um, Mm -hmm. it's kind of hurtful when your eyes are being opened to a lot of things. Doesn't mean that I haven't sat on the bed every once in a while and thought about it and said, oh, get this together I'm gonna get this is this gonna be the time I hope it's the time but anyway my um my family support back then was like really really big and 
the next thing you know, I'm going to jail at 30 years old. No, I think I was 31. I was a late bloomer, you know. I really was. And my rap sheet will always read that I'm a shoplifter because in my mind, the stores were always insured, you know. Mm -hmm. I wasn't personally yeah. hurting people. Just as in my addiction, I said I can sniff heroin, so <laughs> I'm not a fiend. As long as I was sniffing, I was safe. But the moment I put a needle in my arm, I knew I was just gone. That, that's just my, my way of thinking and trying to rationalize things. Mm -hmm. And first time going into the county jail, which for me, I, I really thought was like a big old pajama party for girls. You know, they make yeah. it just that easy for you. Yeah. You know, they make you feel comfortable and you're sitting there and you're waiting to go to court and all the people that you used to see in the streets, you know, hey, we all in one place and we all, you know, chilling out but not even realizing what it's doing to my family at home. My mom was now forced to raise my children my father and my mom's relationship being strained because one wants to and the other doesn't. You know, that's when I had to realize, like, my family, my mom and dad really have a relationship because I didn't see them as anything other than my parents. I didn't see them as having a relationship where they sit down and they discuss and they, do, and they worry about their children. But going through this process, this is what became aware to me because each time going home, I could see them, you know, the door open and I come in. My mom was like, and my dad's sitting there, he got his head down because, you know, him and my mom are going to argue about this later. But they always made a way to where when I was right, I was always welcome back into home. I have to say, I might jump around some because I'm a little nervous and I'm trying to get a little bit of everything out. But, um... It became a time um, where I was embarrassed to go home, as I said. And um, my parents even tried to make a way that I can go into the um, back door mm -hmm. and go in the basement and get some rest before my kids, mm -hmm. you know, see me or anything like that. And I was really appreciative of that. But going into the county jail, as I said, it was fun for me until... Um, no, I have to say this. Everybody used to tell me, Polly, what, you back again, you skid bitten. And everybody used to talk about prison. And they, the way they, these women talked about prison, it was because they felt like it was like a college dorm. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't just stuck in one place. When you're in the county jail, you're really in a cell. And at one point, it was six women mm -hmm. in one cell where they'd come over the toilet, right? in between you know, and that's a lot of it leaves room for a lot of arguments and a lot of fights within you know the jail but anyway i was going in and out of the county jail and then at 50 what was that 56 i believe 56 it became real when i violated and i ended up getting a, a sentence a three flat. I couldn't believe it because, I, let me, okay, I'm sorry. Going back, and it's not that I didn't try to get treatment. I didn't know what treatment was. Mm -hmm. Going in and out of the county jail, I didn't, I have to tell how I got to the um, prison. Going in and out of county jail, no one ever offered me treatment. I never knew what treatment was. I remember one day walking down the street in Passaic and they had a sign, Doors to the Future. And then I walked in and I asked the lady, what is this place? And she says, it's a treatment center. I said, well, I need help. She had me fill out all the paperwork. And at the end, she said, do you have insurance? I didn't have insurance. And that was my one time going into a treatment facility trying to get some type of help. So one time I committed a crime. I got my first drug offense, and um, they sentenced me to probation. While I'm on probation, I didn't take it seriously at all. I really, I really didn't know what it was about because most times I was in and out the county so fast that I never was there long enough to 
you know, hear anything about treatments and anything like that. So I got back home and I'm on the streets and I'm running and I'm dog, I'm dog tired. And I heard about drug court. And one day I'm so high, I go sit in this drug court because I'm tired and I knew sooner or later I was gonna violate probation. And I just went in, I sat in, and I was the last person in the courtroom. And the judge says, how can I help you? Are you here for someone? And I'm like, no, I need help. And I want to try your program because I don't have insurance, insurance being the most important thing. So now <clears throat> he puts me on drug court. I do violate. And now I get sentenced to a three flat, my first time going to prison. And like you were saying, when they put you in that truck, there's no windows, you're shackled, mm -hmm. your hands, your feet, you do, you feel like cattle. You, you really feel like cattle. And I get there, I'm afraid because I'm amongst women who um, have really serious crimes and I don't think I belong there because I'm just a shoplifter mm -hmm. and a drug addict. But going into the prison, what I see is a lot of women with mental illnesses, as you have said. Um, drugs are really, really rampant in the prison system. All you have to do is say that you have a little headache and you will be getting psych meds and they do mm -hmm. keep you high all mm -hmm. the time. There's a very high rate of women who leave the prison and within months they are dead from overdoses because of the medication that they're receiving mm -hmm. yeah. in the prison. They're not helping with the situations. You see a psychiatrist or a social worker for approximately 10 minutes and yeah. then you're prescribed more medication, mm -hmm. which the <laughs> inmates in turn turn around and sell to each other. There was no help, and the whole time I was in there, I, I was just praying to get out, but I got out and I went to a halfway house. And at the halfway house, I was introduced to a reentry program. Mm -hmm. And um, Governor McGreevy, a uh, former governor of New Jersey, was there, and I went through the reentry program and decided to go back to school. I always said if I, my kids can go, and I'm really hard on education, right, Ashley? I go, <laughs> yeah, that, that's just the one thing about me. Even though my brain was clouded and fogged, I always wanted better for my kids, and I used to tell them all the time, education is the key, and they could do or be anything that they wanted to. Like, I was, I was really hard, and I was always trying to encourage them so when Ashley said she was coming to Harbor, I was just ecstatic. Not to take away, I have two more children. I have um, one that graduated Montclair, and I have one that's in Lincoln University, and my baby just got accepted to college, too. So, I am proud. But, um, I just want to take the opportunity to say thank you. I know I'm all over the place. I'm just, I'm just no, nervous, not, yes. and I really appreciate you giving me this time to speak. Thank you. Thank you for sharing with us and both of you the raw and just uplifting stories of what I would consider as survival in the system. Um, Sylvia, there's a, a couple things you mentioned in your story, in the processing of your story that um, I'd like to re, like, echo. Okay. Yeah, um, in the beginning you mentioned the importance of religion and spirituality in your life and how uh. that really, I, as I took it, was your grounding. Um, but then as you got into more your story, you lost that aspect. Mm -hmm. Is there somewhere in there that spirituality actually played a, a part of your story? Um, I believe I'm alive because of my spirituality. Because um, my belief in God was so strong. Even as I'm doing the bad things, before going into a story, it's crazy. I would always say, God, please just let me get in here, steal a few things and come out. Mm -hmm. and. I won't do it again. I mean, it's, it's crazy thinking, 
But I knew each time that I did something that I was committing a sin and I had to get right with God. Mm -hmm. I, I knew that, I, I knew in my heart that my life wouldn't be right if I didn't have God in my life. He's always been there, even when I thought that he wasn't. He's mm -hmm. never turned his back on me. And like I said, religion does play a big part in my life. And another part that um, I'd like to reiterate as well is you mentioned your family, your very large, large <laughs> family. <laughs> um, but you also mentioned it in a way that they, that the, the abundance of them really, in a way, had a hand in the way you process things. Yeah, they did. And I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I have to mention because um, a big portion of my family are um, police. Um, they were all work in the judicial system. Mm -hmm. I always had help that was available, but I always ran. Mm -hmm. You know, I always ran away from their help, and I always hid from shame and embarrassment. Mm -hmm. So, but they were always there, and they all, they're always there to help me celebrate the good things, and they're always there for me for the bad things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And just like in regards to this being... Um, an uplifting black conference. Mm -hmm. um, is there anywhere within, and Stacey, I invite you to answer this too, um, that your culture and the upbringing of who you are and your ethnic identity, did that play any role of your processing or um, anything like that? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, First of all, going in as black, I already had one strike against you. Mm -hmm. You know, that that was just the main thing because I saw how black women were getting sentenced as opposed to how white women were getting sentenced for the same similar crimes. And for me, I come from a really um, close, small town, and everybody knew everything that I was doing but they all started to support me whenever I was doing good. They were always there for me, mm -hmm. always. But I, I was ashamed. I was ashamed. I was humiliated for a lot of the things that I was doing. But when I was doing good, they were always there for me. I think that's, um, that has always been a difficult question for me because when we talk about culturally growing up, in the black neighborhood, I was always teased as being white, mm. right? And so that was part of my trauma. I was always, you know, light skin, bright skin, white skin, like, you know, mm. I, and I always wanted to be dark skin. Mm. I just thought black <laughs> was beautiful and I never thought it was black. I didn't know what I was. So, and I didn't really understand culture. It was just so much, I don't know, dysfunction going on in the community, in the home. It was just like, I didn't know what I was. I just existed. And then, and until I got into the, I loved the way you just now <laughs> broke that down. Like, that's kind of difficult to hear what happens with us right. and, and what happens in the prison system. Yeah. Right. And so, going in a prison system is probably where I learned that I was black. Mm -hmm. And how do I own that? Mm -hmm. You know, I remember one time I was locking my hair, and the only way to really lock it, you don't have any type of, you know. Sure. You know, <laughs> cosmetics or anything in a prison. So I sewed my braids together. Mm -hmm. And I tried to sew all black in the front. You know, I had a little sewing kit, and I had colors all in the back. And I went through the chow hall, and the sergeant said to me, what is that in your hair? Mm -hmm. And I said, thread. And he said, oh, really? And he's pulling out his, mm -hmm. you know, note mm -hmm. to give me a disciplinary, a D report. He's like, where would you get the thread? And I was like, off a of commissary. Right. What? He's like, you have a needle? And I'm like, yeah. And so he's like, give me your ID. So I gave him the ID. And then he looks at his peer officer and says, what do you think about that? And the officer said, oh, I think that you do that. You people mm -hmm. do that to your hair to set up for the birds to come down and shit in it. Yeah. I think right then and there, I had never really experienced racism outside of my own community. And I looked at him and was like, you people? Mm -hmm. I was, it took every part of me not to break down and, and let him see that pain. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, So I went back to the unit, and there was a black CO woman, and she just knew, what's wrong with you? And I said it to her. And she kind of disclosed some information, how much they get. 
the male population to the female black yeah. population. Mm -hmm. It's a horrible system. I, I couldn't even imagine thinking of my own family mm -hmm. too that are police officers right. and what they must have endured from the white counterpart. Mm -hmm. Trying to really understand what culture means. I mean, culture means a lot. Right? Culture means, you know, our dialogue, uh, the way we do our hair, the, what foods we eat. You know what I mean? Not just being that you're a person of color or non-color. It's where you come from. And it wasn't until I came home to really understand that, that the heart of me is the heart of my community. And I needed to own that. And I needed to be a part of that. I needed to stop running. Geographical cure doesn't work. Every time I try to run, my mother sent me to Atlanta, I came back. I got in trouble in Atlanta, I'm back here again. Every time I ran to Virginia and my sister passed away, I got in trouble. You know, geographical cure just don't work. It's just kind of time to sit still and understand where you come from and giving back to which you belong. So. Thank you. I think we can agree that um, within the criminal legal system itself, the wrecking ball that just keeps messing things up is the lack of cultural competency, mm -hmm. for sure. Well, can I? Because yeah. that's, you know, that word. <laughs> you know, as a licensed clinician, I've been taken, I have to keep my continuing education units up. And so we talk about cultural. Can we really be cultural competent? Mm -hmm. no. I was interviewed. I don't know if Yaron is here, but I have a Chinese student from Harvard mm -hmm. that would, she wants to help write my book. I'm like, great. I need. I, I would love to tell my story in a book form. And we talked about cultural competency. Now I can study as a clinician if a patient is in front of me and understand that culture. But I could never be competent in that. No one could ever be competent in from where I come from if you hadn't come from there. So I've always had a problem with competency. We can learn, we can try to understand, we can be compassionate, we can be empathetic. Her and I sat and we talked about how the Chinese structure, the, you know, the, the hard, um, what am I trying to say, from where I come from, my mom would be like, go read a book. And never said what book. She just wanted me to sit still for a minute. She never said what book. But in your aunt's culture, she had this magnitude like a scroll. Like, this is what you're supposed to do. I'm trying to think of the word that I, I can't think of. But, um, you know, the hardness that the families put on you to learn. You know, from growing up in Orchard Park, I went to school around the corner from Orchard Park, Fox. I went to school in the project. Albert Palmer and the Dearborn. Right? We were always told that Chinese were smarter and better than us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they certainly are because they have this. <laughs> they have to do the work. We come from a culture that says, you know, go somewhere, sit down. It was just too much. Coming from 12 children, my mom couldn't keep up. Right? And so most of our communities was like that. Just the generational trauma and the, and the you know, dynamics of dysfunction. We didn't have that, um, I can't think of the word that I'm trying to think of, but we didn't have that expectation. Mm, right. That expectation, heavy on a black person. Mm -hmm. I have, mm -hmm. you know, friends who, the Jacksons, I don't know, Ellen Jackson was the dean of Northeastern University. She was on the same street. I dated her son, Troy. The expectation from a black woman dean on her children was heavy. Troy couldn't handle it. Troy got involved in, a smart young man, got involved with drugs and alcohol. Clean today, but looking at the different structure culturally. From what your own has to, you know, and, and just the disclosure of her structure, of her saying, you know what, I got to live my life. And we need to take that stance. It's not saying you're going against the grain. It's just saying it's too much to put that type of expectation on one small individual. Mm -hmm. We could expect that the sun's going to rise and it might rain, but you can, you know, I don't have expectations on human beings. We're, we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. We're not perfect. We can be in a religious sense and say we were made of the image of God. Mm -hmm. 
that doesn't mean that you're made in the image of perfection. question because I want to open it up for questions for everybody else. Um, this is a personal question and especially since um, Stacy, you mentioned your work with the Families for Justice for Healing. Yes. Um, but it's a question for both of you. Okay. Um, I think it's whenever we're looking at prison abolition and just um, seeing the statistics placed, we're not really we're not really told whether the statistics are for male institutions mm, or female yeah. and I think there's this like conflation of they're the same but they're not mm -hmm. um, and I want to know about the shifting of the framework but also more um, exclusively to the the work that Massachusetts is doing to create a new women's prison Ooh. in Middlesex County for Ooh. 50 million dollars thank um, you and the Ooh. fact that that 50 million dollars could be used for programs that we need yes um, mm -hmm. can you both speak to, to that yeah. I definitely can. <laughs> so let me just say this. $50 million. Do you know Families for Justice? I'm a board member of Families for Justice Healing, but I do a lot with that organization because it's, it's just a powerful, small organization. It's got a big, big voice. And we've been able to gather on Saturday mornings or Saturday afternoons. We've been able to gather different people from different communities, predominantly white people that's been coming to our community saying, we're shutting the jails down. Literally, like trying to have all this, all these people that with different type of skill sets. We have the groups that come in and do research. And we've been able to find out two to one, two officers to one person incarcerated. For the level of incarcerated people, we're one of the lowest. We're probably the third lowest incarcerated state. Oklahoma was the highest, especially for women, right? And so you're talking about hiring. You have a correction association that's asking for money, 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 money. And we're like, to hire more correctional officers. We're like, for what reason are you doing that? There's less than 300 women in Framingham, and you've got a whole bunch of male population who are, you know, on county sentences. If we look at the statistics and the numbers, there are women who are incarcerated in Massachusetts. They're on pretrial status on a county level. What does that mean? That means in the state that looks at nonviolent to violent crimes, you got 60% of women that are awaiting trial for low level offenses, property value. Can you imagine you're mad at your boyfriend and you bust somebody's window and then you get arrested and you're charged with a crime for that type of anger? Like instead of doing something different and restorative, meet people together. Restorative justice works. Let her pay that bill and then help her relieve herself from that pain, that trauma. 60 50, it was 60, now they'd shut it down to 50, and $60 million was on the books with DCAM. DCAM is a state organization, I don't remember the acronym, Department of Cultural Maintenance for Massachusetts, something like that. You can look that up, DCAM. Is the organization that the state holds all this massive amount of money for these different state organizations, and one of them is the prison system. So they've been able to put out this RFP $650,000 RFP for architects to come in and rebuild this new prison that they're trying to build. Well, we intercepted that. And how we did that is we found out who the designers and architects was putting in for the RFP. And we asked for meetings. They met with us. And by the time we finished our stories, real women, formerly incarcerated women's stories, they bailed out. They bailed out. Like, that's huge. They met with us. They, one woman architect, she just started crying. She said, I have a daughter. I thought that we were doing something good by building a good prison with a trauma unit. Girlfriend, you can't build a good prison with a trauma unit in the prison. It's traumatic going in the prison. Do you know what it takes for a woman to be strip searched and bent over and coughed? Never mind doing cavity searches. Mm -hmm. This shit is real. Mm -hmm. This is evasive, this is demeaning, and this is wrong. 
Try to go into prison and ask for a tampon. I go into the universities and I tell the stories, and one girl in Berkeley just started crying, talking about, you mean to tell me you don't have tampons? No, you have to ask a male CO for a tampon, he gives you two. I'm sorry, I get graphic with this shit. You're standing there, if a woman is bleeding down her leg, you get a regular tampon too, and you gotta go back and ask for it in the next 30 minutes, and then you're told that wasn't enough? When universities are giving it, to, giving it to the girls in the dorms free. So you can't even imagine what happens in the prison system. $60 million for what reason? Well, we could do housing, we can bring them into treatment. You could give half of that to New Beginners Reentry Services. In mm. our new house that we're closing on. We're building treatment centers. We're talking about reimagining communities. How do we divest or get some of that money, divest some of that money out of it and invest into our communities for housing? Clean that stuff up down Mass Ave with all the homeless and addiction and people want a home. People say, well, what you gonna do? Put them in there so they can OD? No, let them have a place to belong and if they learned how to sleep on the floor, they can learn how to sleep in the bed. Like human beings, stop treating us like we're inhumane. We're human beings struggling. I also have a, I, I have to say this. Now I'm learning. I said I'm a student. I'm always gonna be a student. But I have a problem when someone in front of me that says I'm so privileged and I'm sorry you have, well you're not so privileged. Mm -hmm. That's a freaking word. Mm -hmm. And that's something you were taught. You were taught that you were better than black people. You were taught that you were given this advantage over us. And some people own that, and I have a problem with it. So I ask, too, to change your mind about how you speak to people, because you don't know where people come from. Mm. Mm. We're, we're only privileged when we take advantage of an opportunity that they say is free world. That's what privilege is. I'm privileged to be here, but I'm not privileged because I'm better than somebody else. Stacy answered everything that needed to be said. <laughs> like I said, I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm just a beginner in in all of this and this advocacy work. And I, I need to have a conversation with you because I am learning some things. I'm from Jersey, and we have only have one women's prison, mm -hmm. so I don't know the ratio or anything like that. Like I, I'm, I'm just a recovering addict trying to make a way and getting a a degree. Yeah, I am in school. Did I tell y'all that? Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was one of my biggest goals, and um, I'm, I'm doing that, and yeah. the reentry program mm -hmm. steered me to that, and they got me a job, too. I love it. Yeah, re I love re entry it. really works, and when I do speak to um, women coming back to the halfway house, because I go back and I speak a lot, and I steer a lot of them to the reentry program, and mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you go in Jersey, what county, there's always <laughs> a reentry program there. Mm -hmm. Reentry also helped me get my apartment. They mm -hmm. paid some of the rent, yep. you know, so yep. I don't know how it works in other states, but I know it's working in my state. Mm -hmm. So whatever Stacy said, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I got a long list of questions left. Um, I can ask another question. Ooh, okay. <laughs> you know, all right. Well, then I'm going. I'm just going to ask you first, Sylvia. Um, so we talk about the opioid crisis and like drug crimes and how the the influx of people are mainly drug related offenses. Um, but we we rarely talk about how there's an opioid. I'm a quote crisis in wealthy communities as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's not talked about because it's abolition in its, its work already. Um, the opi opioid crisis in wealthy communities are, are getting taken care of. They're getting the resources. They're getting, they're getting the help they need. But that just perpetuates more stigma on low-income families that have similar troubles, similar struggles. Um, how, how do you think as like future um, 
movers and prison abolitionists that we can try and shift the framework and try and shift it more as we need these resources too. It's the same same abolitionist work, but you're not calling abolition work. You're just calling it resources. Is there any way that you can uplift us in our, our steady work for that? Well, I'm still kind of startled on the fact that it's now all of a sudden an opioid mm. addiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Opioids, opioids for me was still always heroin. That's mm -hmm. been around for for ages, but because now it's being um, given widely to rich populations, people in rich places, and mo mostly, you know, white neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and it's coming out in pill form. And when they get to the point where they can afford these hundred dollar pills, the next thing you know, it comes down to them buying the heroin. So now that it's affecting other communities other than the black community, now it's become an epidemic. But it's been here, right? Yeah. It's always been here. It's, it's already toured down the black communities. I, I remember 60s and 70s coming up in that time. It was always around then, right? Yeah. But that's how we got the insurance now, right? Because of where they live and you know where they come from and things like that. I'm just trying to stay in recovery, but it's always been here. It's always been here. So it kind of amazes me when people, all of a sudden, it's a right. Right. addiction. Right. It's always been here. So, so you know I'm going to bring it, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I got to bring it. Okay. So I got, I'm, you know, you said it, right? You said insurance. Mm -hmm. Systemically. So I just had to learn systematic and systemic and, you know, what the difference. I still can't really process, but what I can process is that it's all by design. Mm. You know, not no disrespect, but we already know what happened in the 60s and 70s. I mean, one day I woke up and my brothers were real sharp and happy and loving, and the next thing you know, they were like this. Yeah. The whole community. So when I say systemically or by systematic design, as now being a clinician and looking at the billing process mm. and looking at the health insurances or free care, Mass Health in Massachusetts, they have it by design. If I call, I still have an 857 number because I can't afford a 617 Verizon bill. So they know I don't have no money. I'm not getting that prescription. Now, I might sound ignorant to say that black people aren't in trouble anymore right now. It's the white communities that's coming into <laughs> treatment. My heart be heavy when I see these young white women coming into treatment and their parents won't even support them. Black people are struggling because they can't get the health insurance that they need. And when I say mass health is by design, women that are coming out of the prison system, out of Framingham, mass, Massachusetts has a law saying we have to have health insurance. So if you're incarcerated, 90 days before release, they coming in, they got a contract with the prison system, with DOC, to make sure that you have health insurance coming out of there. But they switched up. It's called standard, and it's called behavioral health. Framingham is allowing women to get standard care if you're outside of Middlesex and um, Middlesex, I just had it on the tip of two counties. Suffolk? Not Suffolk, Norfolk. not Norfolk. Um, I'll I get it. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. There's two counties. Worcester. What's Worcester County? Worcester County and Middlesex are the two biggest counties in Massachusetts. Right? They are holding the bigger population of DOC connection. You feel that? Middlesex County DA has a contract, and the Worcester County DA has a contract with Mass Health to say we're only gonna provide behavioral health services to these two populations. Excluded 
Who's in Suffolk County? Black people. <laughs> so when they come out, they're not able to get behavioral health until they upgrade next year. They cut it off. We used to be able to get on the phone and say, hey, someone has standard. Standard is just having a primary care doctor. And it's by their choice, not yours. I've been going to Beth Israel Hospital since I was, since Nana. Since I went from Children's Hospital to Beth Israel. Well, they try to intercept me, and I'm like, wait a minute, I have a primary care doctor already, and I need a therapist. Shit, I got mental health. I'm yeah. disturbed. Like, I need help. Yeah. You're going to let me out of a prison system, incarcerated me because I had trauma and addiction, but, you know, the addiction part first. You got to handle the addiction before you even handle the mental health. Mm. And then you're going to let me back out to the same cycle without having any support? That's where abolition comes from. You need to know your stuff. You need to know how it's by design and what they're doing to keep us behind. Make us feel demeaned and like inmates and ex-felons and this Corey and no, you can't go into housing because of your Corey and no, like really? No, you can't get behavioral health. You don't deserve to be treated. You don't deserve for your therapist or for you to get any type of services. It's all by design. And so now as a provider for New Beginnings Reentry Services, I have to say that strategically I was trying to learn what I needed to learn before we even got to the house. Mm -hmm. We're not even open yet, but we have the property. Mm -hmm. I needed to get to the point where I'm saying, we can't keep allowing you to do that to us in our community. We deserve help. There are women who are serving life sentences or natural life sentences that we're going to get them out of there. And they need the support and help that they deserve. So our program is up to 18 months, and I'm not dealing with no federal or state grants because it's going to restrict us to whom we can serve. They don't allow you to deal with sex offenders. Women are sex offenders, too. Mm -hmm. They're not going to allow us to deal with arsonists or someone who committed murder. Mm -hmm. Again, in the world's eyes, these women committed murder because they're murderers. Mm -hmm. In our eyes, we're saying they were trying to survive the ultimate. 97% mm -hmm. of women that are incarcerated suffer from trauma long before. You know, women aren't supposed to be high. Women aren't supposed to be an alcoholic. You're supposed to be a mother. You're supposed to be an obedient woman. That's what society has told us. That's why you was in secret. That's why we have so much shame and, and guilt and degradation. And our parents recognize that because my dad, too, would come pick me up and put me in a car so nobody would see me. And the shame just kept coming and kept going and kept going. Mm -hmm. And so we need to really pay attention to what's happening with this system. If you hadn't met the penitentiary, or if you have somebody in the penitentiary, I, again, suggest you come down to Families for Justice is Healing, Tuesday night, 6 o'clock. Even if you just need to come and inquire and see the work that we do. We need some student attorneys to help some of us understand and visit some of these people that are in prison that should not be incarcerated. They need help. They need mental help, mental health services. So I don't know if I answered that. I you think did. I went on a tangent. But <laughs> That's open it up. All right. So I'm going to open it up for questions. First question up here. Um, just to add to that last question that you had about um, the opioid epidemic in certain areas um, and how they're receiving their resources and others aren't, I would say it's the, the, the connections, the, the, the um, I guess, the, the level of networking that they have. Mm -hmm. you know, if you have top dollar, you can talk to those judges, you can mm -hmm. talk to the DA, yeah. you can get your, you know, your child out mm -hmm. um, without having to go through the processes that we have. Their resources are much vaster because of their tax bracket. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. They're providing to those, you know, uh, contacts. Mm -hmm. You know, let's make a deal. Mm -hmm. We don't have that. No. Mm -hmm. 
and and that needs to be that needs to change because we all have rights. Mm-hmm. We all have to be treated equally. Mm-hmm. And just because you can provide me, you know, a, a connection to either receive sort, certain resources that you know you're looking for, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't go over mm. somebody else's opportunities. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They should be treated equally. Right? Mm-hmm. So I, I would just say that 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 is an issue as well. Thank you. No. You weren't like, yeah, see, yeah, see. Yeah. Can you hear when people are talking in the back row? You want to try? Yeah. Uh, um, we'll just, we'll have this here. Okay, great. I'm going to go right here because your hand is still up. Um, first of all, uh, thank you, Ms. Borden. Thank you, Ms. Thank Lipson. you. Um, Yay. So moving. Mm. Um, and uh, particularly as a, as a man of faith, uh, I, I hear God, the Spirit, whatever you are saying, working and working in you in the world. I'm grateful. Yeah. So Thank grateful. You. But I have a very specific question for you, Ms. Borden. Okay. Um, you said that the behavioral health element of, uh, uh, of Massachusetts Health isn't available in Suffolk County. Mm-hmm. That seems like such a solvable uh, advocacy issue mm-hmm. um, with the mental health, uh, well, with the health care uh, reforms that are trying to move their way through the legislative system, the statewide mm-hmm. legislative mm-hmm. system right now. Mm-hmm. Is there anything happening around that? Like that should just be a given that anyone coming out of the system has access to behavioral health. Right. So you're right. I mean, they just passed um, the law for service providers to have access for mental health now. Great. We was only having the support of the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services for substance abuse issues. We've been fighting legislatively, sitting in front of um, different um, caucuses, listening sessions, trying to see why Massachusetts is not connecting substance abuse and mental health. Why isn't the system connected for mental health in the prison? In Framingham, there was a time when I left Framingham, there was overcapacitated. They're only supposed to hold 565 women. There was over 1,200 women in there with two mental health providers. That's why they kept their people, right? So now Massachusetts just the other day passed the law saying that we should have more access to mental health services. But when I say the prison system is not connected for Suffolk County, If a woman is coming out of Framingham, even though now the law passed, now it's making providers have a mental health provider on site. Instead of saying we should be able to refer them to mental health services. Where is it at? We have a department of mental health. That means, okay, if you're coming in for that type of service, are you going to be incapacitated? Are we going to call the best team to bring you? Do you have to say you're suicidal? Do you have to say the word, I'm going to kill myself to have access to that service? Now, all day long, you're going to be able to have the MAT, medication-assisted treatment under the behavioral health plan. They're getting a lot of money for that. It is saving lives, but they're getting a lot of money for that. We're talking about mental health, bipolar disorder, substance abuse disorder, severe depression, anxiety. What about multiple personality disorder? We all have it. (laughs) It's inevitable. You're not the same as you was at five, but you're still holding on that five little, that little boy in there, respectfully, I'm saying. That little boy created something at five years old. 10, 15, 20, there's five personalities right there. How many times do you want to go ride a bike and play? Everybody has multiple, some are severer than others. But until we can learn to say the word, we have mental illness and connect all them personalities into one holistically. We're not going to heal as long as we rely on the system. Did that answer your question? Mm. Cool. (laughs) Cool. (laughs) Hello. Yes. Hi, my name is Lynette Tyler, and I want to welcome 
our two guest speakers who are very well. Thank um, you. I want to say incarceration starts way before you get locked up. Mm. Okay. What are some of the ways that you think, I know, that you can go into a household and start, we know the families that are having the problems, mm -hmm. okay? We know what's going on in that household. So how do the police mm. start with going into the housing to help instead of that last time, lock her up? Mm. Mm. You're taking that mother away from that child, yep. that aunt, that grandmother, you know, the family. So how do we go, how do you think that mm. we can stop that? You know, because I feel it, I've seen it, mm -hmm. and I know what it's about. Yeah. Me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not good at any question and answering, um, but I'm gonna definitely try. From what I've seen, um, I think they need more police training. Yeah. Um, more, sensitiv more sensitivity training. You know, they should um, always have someone on him that understands mental illness or the mm -hmm. dynamics of the family. So I, I think knowing that first before going in, that might help. I don't know if I answered it right, but that's just the best right now. But they are trained. Mm -hmm. But what kind of training are we getting? They're not that training for know. our community. Right. I you know, there's answer. different communities that I can go into a household, I take Bernie and mm -hmm. I'm just picking them out. I don't understand their culture. I don't understand their language. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say this. I love that question. We just talked about that. I don't know. I can't remember a minute ago. But last night, we was, I was just talking about, where's the police? I don't, I don't really feel like we need police. I mean, they, them too, the association, is trying to grow. More monies are going into police. We can police our own community this time. We need to really start doing transformative justice. Mm -hmm. You have a problem, we should deal with it mm -hmm. collectively. Mm -hmm. I don't remember there's an organization in Colorado. The women started their own community policing. They have ambulance, fire department trucks themselves. They call amongst each other. They have an issue with husband and wives, they call them to come and resolve it. They don't call the police. But since we do have police, and you answer the question, Lynette, it's called CANS assessment. Anybody heard of that? They should be mandated to go and take the government free course for CANS. Children, adolescents, needs, and strengths before they enter a family's household, especially dealing with children. Especially when you're, what happens at the age of 12? Puberty happens. Shit, I don't know, I don't know who I am. My parents, all of a sudden there's a disconnect. Parents can't handle it, they forget. They were a adolescent one time too. This isn't to blame any parents, this is to say that we should understand that some of our children didn't develop needs and strengths. People sit in front of me and I'm doing an intake and I'm like, what's your strengths? And they're like, I didn't know my own strengths either until I had to learn it. At 58 years old, I'm just developing my needs. I know what I don't need and I know what I need. I mean, it's so totally different than what I've always wanted. But when you just don't know, you don't know. And the Boston police, Talking about your people. <laughs> My aunt is a retired police officer who was a good police officer because she was a good person because she came from our community and she understands our community. And she's my one of my board of directors because she understands this stuff. And so we need to help our community, help our police department be educated. The court system is starting to do it. I, I deal with these probation officers a lot now, and I'm like, you have a degree in psychology? That's hot shit. So let's not send that person to jail then. Mm -hmm. 
So you know where they came from. Well, the Boston police need that same type of training. And I would suggest they start with becoming a CANS assessor. It's free. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Nordia Bennett. Um, so I'm a seminarian at Union Theological Seminary, and I think it's very easy for us to be in classrooms and not have these truthful conversations about what it means to do this work. And I, my question is, what does it look like for faith leaders to actively be in the prisons and not just going to pray and not just going to give a nice on like band-aid shoulder talk about life, but what does it really look like for us to do this transformative work that you're speaking of mm -hmm. and for us as faith leaders to be at the forefront, to be at those doors, to be at those meetings so our voices can say this is morally wrong. Right. These bodies matter, and we believe in the fullness of what God has created for these bodies on earth. Yeah. So for me, as someone in training that's going to do this work, what does that look like for me to be practical and not just be high in the sky in a utopia, but actually practical to do this work? Yeah. Transformative justice is hard work. If, if you're going into the prison system, you got to go in with your heart wide open to say, empathetically, not really trying to understand what happened to an individual, but just saying, okay, I'm here. I don't understand what you went through, but I'm here for you. And how can you assist that individual with meeting themselves, forgiving themselves? How could you even have that dialogue to say, what happened to you can't define you? So therefore, we're going to transform what's happening in this moment. And when you're released into the community and continue to transform, not just yourself, but the community as a whole. But it starts with the individual. It starts with forgiving. It starts with healing. And it starts with understanding that even if you encounter someone else, and I use, I use Hernandez a lot, because we really don't know what happened in his life. He had the world on his shoulder. He had so much money. They didn't even focus on this young man who came out of New Jersey, Connecticut. You never even seen his parents around in the courts. He had this young man who had this heavy weight at a club. Supposedly, somebody stepped on his foot, bumped him, spilled his drink. And instead of him taking a moment to wait for that individual to say, I'm sorry, and him receiving it, he reacted. This is what I'm talking about, of how to take someone like that who was in the system. We could have went in there and gave that brother some help to help him transform himself, to help him forgive himself before he took his life, if he did. I'm not quite sure that that really happen, but this is the part of transformative justice. Before he does harm to himself or to someone else. Before we have to react and call the police, you react and call your community. Because you're in that transformation of yourself. Did that answer that? Kinda? So what does it look like for faith leaders to be a part of this dialogue to do the work? Well, I mean, culturally again, Um, I have to say I have. I have to say that now that we have this movement with the National Council, we have men Tuesday nights. Um, Satara came. That night, it was full. Community people are starting to really come in and see that there's a community-based program that's here to help and do this type of work. Right? So some of these brothers just got out. There was four new guys who heard about us in the prison. Because we have men that come to the meeting that go up in the prison and do this type of healing circles. And the men are really coming out and they're receptive to this. They're like, I just spent 19 years in prison. I don't want to go back. The police are harassing me. You know, when you're pulled over by Boston police, they should not be running your record. Run my plate. My plate doesn't connect to the record. But you're taking an extra step and running my record, and now you want to harass me because I just did 19 years. And now the anger starts coming in, and transformatively, they're recognizing they have tools to use. So now they're saying there's a community-based program that's going to help us because I heard that in prison. 
So what's happening? So unfortunately, we're running out of time, a little over time. Um, but I actually, too much. it's OK. Recognizing <laughs> the rarity of this panel, I do not feel comfortable closing without asking for two sentences <laughs> of what would you say to an institution that invests in prisons, such as Harvard, um, and what would you say? What would you say to people who, like myself, who are mobilizing the divestment process? Mm. Mm. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm gonna go along with Ashley. I'm like I said. I'm learning a lot that's going on. Like I'm not all into the politics and everything, but I'm here for her fight. Whatever her fight is, I'm gonna be there with her in support. So if you want Harvard to say, get rid of it, then get rid of it. That just kind of hit me hard. I probably would not even have been here if I had known that. How can universities support the prison industry complex? If you could hear the stories, I have a young man who spent 17 years in Angola prison, Louisiana. Anybody know about Louisiana, Angola? It's on the slave ground, on the plantation. When I talk about design, when he sits in front of me in session and he describes the toilet right here in the stalls right here, the toilet right here and the stalls right here and you have to go in those bathrooms damn near naked. We're talking about men. We're talking about human beings. And you're allowing them to sit here. If you don't have one foot down ready to fight because this man is standing with his butt in his face, you're perpetuating the idea that it's OK that a man can sit there and consume himself with sex all day long. And a University to allow them to continue that type of behavior sucks. It's inhumane, and they should be ashamed. Harvard University should be ashamed of themselves. And, that, and that's it. So we want to say thank you so much to not just our panelists, but also to our moderator. And we just are so grateful for the conversation that you've held here in this space. Mm -hmm.